Hi friends, I'm Adrian File. And I'm John File. And welcome to the Love the Process Podcast. We've been married 15 years, 14 good ones, and we have four awesome kids. My career has centered around process improvement and leadership development. And I've been an entrepreneur since I was four, and I'm currently an owner and CEO of a insurance company and corporate training team. We are working to become better versions of ourselves every day, and we invite you to join us as we share our journey and the lessons we have learned in life, business, and figuring out how to love the process to becoming great. Let's go. (laughs) Hey, friends. We're so excited to have a guest with us today. We've got Dr. Rob McKenna from Wild Leaders. Rob just had his first TED Talk go live. We're so excited to hear about it. Rob, why don't you give us a little intro into who you are and what you love? Oh, Adrian, that's a long question. I, uh, um, so I, yeah, I'm CEO of Wild Leaders Inc. And Wild stands for Whole and Intentional Leader Development. Um, I spent, uh, gosh, 25 plus years uh, in sort of a dual role of working with all kinds of leaders across just all kinds of contexts, but also as an academic. So I was um, all those years from the time that I had no business doing it was a department chair of a graduate program was at two different universities. And, uh, and so I've always been kind of a, there's deeper roots, rooting in my story of why leaders, I always say that I don't really care that much about leadership, but I care deeply about leaders. Um, it's just the way I'm wired. And I know that someone needs to think about leadership principles, but I just, I, um, I think about the psychology of leaders all the time. So um now it's all that we also have a foundation called the wild foundation which raises money for providing world-class leader preparation to people that can't afford it um because one of the things i feel convicted by is that you know every major movement of change in our world um begins with a leader Hmm. but we don't talk about that very much we talk about the major movements of change but we don't talk about building capacity for people that will actually step out and go first so Hmm. i just uh, i know you all share that heart with me too um I think that's enough. I'm, I've been married for 23 years. Nice. I don't know how many of those have been good. You could ask my wife, but, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and we are now, my t- two sons are both in college. So one's a freshman, one's a sophomore. And so we're empty nesters and uh, oh, we have no idea how to do that. Like it's been since fall and we don't have Costco shelves anymore. <laughs> like, you don't, we can't eat that much. So literally my wife's in the garage. Like, I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, I'm destroying the Costco shelves. Cause we can open up some space. So it's just a, it is a weird time of life. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Where are your kids going to school? Uh, one's at Point Loma, the freshman, Point Loma Nazarene University down in San Diego. Okay. And uh, the That's other awesome. one is a sophomore at Seattle Pacific University. So um, he stayed more local to where we live. So they're both doing awesome. It's just, I feel very blessed that they're doing great. So. And you're involved with Seattle Pacific, right? Yeah, I was there. Well, I was there for 21 years. Um, and then, uh, wild leaders started to take off the first version of kind of the centerpiece of what we do, this, this whole leader development system launched in 2010 and, um, and it was working pretty well for me, but then I've always been this kind of mutt or hybrid person where I I have been a business leader, but then I'm also have my, you know, I have my academic role and, uh, and as that was wild leader started to grow, I was getting to this point where I was just getting tougher and tougher. I never really, I didn't know any different because I've always run a business and had a program and a responsibility at the university. And, uh, and so right before January 8th, 2020, mm-hmm. um, I resigned from my role at the university after 21 years and a program that I built from scratch, which was near and dear to my heart, you know, with other great people. And, uh, and then, so the business, cause the business was going and then the pandemic hit in March. <laughs> so uh, it was, uh, but the timing ended up creating incredible opportunities for us to serve across contexts I never even began to imagine. Mm. So um, I do have that part of me that I'm, I am a psychologist at heart. Um, so mm. that part of understanding deeper research around leader preparation and development, uh, but the connecting that to people's experiences is kind of what's been my sweet spot, I guess. So that's a lot. It's a lot, John. Well, let's talk about let's talk about that. I mean, I really love, um, you know, there's this this idea I see more and more. Um, you know, the theory and the practice, right? And and working to and I, I think it's like, do you want cookies or milk? I'll take both. You know, I mean, maybe if you're only going to give me one, I'll take cookies, and I'll you know, I wish I had milk. But the point being, like the the Merriam is is where the magic happens, and so I love. 
I'm a lot more, you know, practice, try, you know, fail, fail try, again. try again, you know, <laughs> yeah, because my, us, right? you know, my, yeah, my, my background and, and, you know, and, and maybe just innate grit from various things that happened in my childhood. So I can fail at high speed and, and, and uh, keep moving forward. And, and, but I love learning more about the psychology, learning more about what currently we're learning in terms of patterns, in terms of especially what you're talking about developing leadership. Cause I, I believe with you, I believe leadership is, is everything. I think anything that's run in any way successfully, you can trace it back to something that's run by a good leader. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, uh, that's, that's been the thing. I think the thing that's been kind of fascinating for me, um, I mean, what some of my, you, you all may or may not know this, but I, I spent most of my, uh, thirties in, uh, as part of multiple longitudinal studies of leaders. And one of the things that emerged from that, we were studying leaders in aerospace, people in nonprofit context, people in ministry context. And so we had these multi-year studies we were doing. And it was a bunch of kind of subject matter experts in the whole in the whole leadership theory space, which is, you know, there's four or five decades of really good research on the developmental journey of leaders. And you can't help but when you start to look at a, 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 a longitudinal narrative of a person who is going first, you can't help but start to connect the dots um, in ways that you see like that a leader, that leader development isn't just about their strengths or it's not just about their competence and it's not just about their purpose. And it's not just about their networks and it's not just, you know, it's, it's not just about their experiences and their trial by a fire moments. It's all of it. It's not even just, it's not even about their agility or their motivations. It's all of those things. And so, and having taught those principles to graduate students for years and years and years, you know, as separate class discussions. So we do a whole section on motivation, a whole section on teams, a whole section on leadership theory and practice and all of it, like it's an organizational culture. And I, I never, I started to have this vision in the early 2000s of what if I could build a way, a process or a system that could live inside of an organization the same way we have operational systems mm -hmm. um, so that we could develop leader capacity in real time. And because we know that leaders develop on the job, they don't develop mm -hmm. in the classroom, they develop on the, I'm not dismissing classrooms because I do a lot of that. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that those classroom experiences need to connect directly to their context because mm -hmm. the, the crucible experiences are experiencing on the job. That's the laboratory. So, um, and, and what's been interesting about the application. Of, so then I took all that theory and I said, what if I could build a set of tools that would target each of these things and then let the leader connect the dots in their narrative, if that makes sense. And it's um, one of the things that's also just one of the things that's been fascinating to me is, you know, for years trying to teach certain theories to students was hard. Like, especially when I was teaching undergrads, I was at Azusa Pacific University before I came to Seattle Pacific and I remember trying to teach like leadership or motivational theories and I'm having to like, let me think, what's a student experience in the dorm that's relevant to this, you know, because they hadn't had those bumps and bruises yet. Right. And, uh, but what's been fascinating now is getting outside of my own, even my own guild, which is industrial organizational psychology, which is, I was described as the most powerful guild in corporate America that most people haven't heard of. Um, and it's, uh, but even getting myself outside of that in my own business leadership, the application of theory, like, like leaders eat it up because they've never actually heard the smart stuff. And it's, it's just like right. theories that were kind of where students would kind of look at me cross-eyed leaders are like, Oh my gosh, I see the application that right now to my labor shortage. Mm. Right. Or, you know, and so it's been, I just, it's been a cool season for me. I'm a, I have last thing I'll say you guys just, I'm not saying too much, but it's just that I have, I always tell people I have two gears. I have like 15 year old juvenile gear and then I have the gear that asks you questions that makes your brain hurt. So it's like, I'm not those small talk conversations at parties. People run away from me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm playing call of duty one minute and then I just want to, I want to talk about. So Adrian, what's the repeating narrative in the back of your mind that promises to limit you today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those are good questions. Though. Those are my gears. <laughs> so <laughs> that's awesome. What do you, what do you, what do you find? I mean, in, in the, the pandemic, you know, I, I really want, I was excited to talk specifically on with your psychology background and, and um, but like the pandemic specifically as a global occurrence that everybody's going through, but not everybody's going through the same way, you know, uh, both locally by country across the globe, 
um, in families, companies, teams, organizations. Like, what has been your sense in terms of both the mindset and, you know, like I just heard, you know, I've been reading and hearing it's resignation nation, you know, that, that more people quit their jobs in January of 2022 than have quit their jobs ever like as a percentage of workforce and and I, there's new jobs and there's a lot of liquidity and there's going to be inflation and all those market factors to realize and but what is what is your take on that as, as somebody who has so much experience in the mind and where you may think it could go as a leader to to go here's where i think it could could yeah. lead yeah i think to go kind of deep fast one of the things that's always been a part of my working philosophy that I don't hear talked about as often as I wish is your fundamental assumptions about the world. And it's why the title of my, my Ted talk was, was, you know, becoming a whole leader in a broken world is like the, the world is broken and it, I don't, and it's a, it's a battle worth fighting for, but it's also, it's a difficult battle because I don't know that we're actually getting better, but I think we have to keep fighting for it. And it's, mm. and so I say that because the pandemic, if there's one thing that was powerful for me was, let me mention kind of the context of what we started doing was before the pandemic hit, um, we had tremendous virtual capacity. So I, I've always been a learning architect. And, and one of the reasons that I think I started there when I, I started, you know, teaching graduates classes when I was 25 and I had no business doing that. Like I didn't, I had a little bit of experience around Microsoft. I'd been dragged around by my brother, you know, and I had a couple of tools in my toolkit, but the one thing that I had was I had had, some really good examples of teachers and professors and some really bad ones. And I thought the bar is pretty low. So the only, the most powerful thing I had when I thought about the way leaders learn was I had their experience. So what I set out to do originally was to, if they're going to bring a textbook on all the greatest theories in organ, organizing or leadership, if I could get those, if I could invite those people, those students, and, I, and keep in mind, I was 25 years old into that classroom hmm in a way that they would bring their experience, what would change? And so I realized um, that so much of my, I'm, an, I'm, I'm a learning architect. Like I love, and, the, and the, the thing that's so cool that you guys, that you probably know is the bar is so low yeah. because it's just not done very well. And so I say that because before the pandemic hit, we had all this virtual architecture that no one wanted. Right. And the pandemic hits and that's all they want. <laughs> so, so what, um, and it was so easy. It's still today so easy to make Zoom awesome because it's so bad in most cases, but it takes intentional architecture. Mm-hmm. So I say that because what, what Zoom allowed me to do is like last week I was with 315 leaders from across context and sitting you know, in my office here and then one, one face-to-face moment. And if there, the one thing it gave me a seat to was the a front row seat to the, the redemption and the brokenness that is going on inside of people mm-hmm. that wasn't new. I don't think, I just mm-hmm. think it exposed our roots. And, um, and so when it comes to leader preparation, I found that that's been our, the call on my heart is to, is to provide an intentional structure and process that could live alongside the rhythm of a leader's life, not just for a moment or a weekend, but could actually, you know, that's what the system is built for. It's what we do all day long. And so I just felt incredibly, um privileged and honored to be able to sit with leaders uh, mm-hmm. because on zoom i could sit with i could have 100 leaders on my screen right here and i'm seeing their faces you know what i'm saying and the first time i went back out to do a keynote i was like i couldn't see the people so that was the gift of the pandemic um I, and I, I i think all the other factors there's so much where we could talk about with that yeah. but um yeah. it's just it was such a gift to me to be able to i just feel that heart for these leaders trying to do impossible things where, you know, transparency, full transparency is no longer a reality because now as a manager, they know things that they legally can't share with other people on their teams. Like it's, you know what I mean? So that these are the real stories of leaders that, um, yeah, I have no convictions about this whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I love that. Do you find, I mean, do you find that, uh, the leadership that's happened that's ensued in these in the moments following the pandemic in, in all spaces. I mean, it, for somebody who likes to look and examine it and study it, I mean, this is the this is a great hyper like if you were developing a professor exam hypothetical on leadership back at Seattle Pacific, mm-hmm. 
you couldn't have dreamed up. I'm not saying this has been a dream, but you couldn't have thought up a scenario quite like this, certainly in the United context, of the United States, with all the various things that were going around, you know, whether both political, um, race, social, like you say, technologically. Yeah. I mean, it was like, yeah. I mean, it's a, like a leadership hypo from hell, I guess, maybe, I don't know, from something. You know, but there's a lot of upside, like you said, but it, it's just been an amazing. And there are so many folks, do they adapt quickly? That's it. So that's my first question. And then the second question is the adaptability to the work, because you can you can lead a horse to water. But you can't always make them drink. And so yeah. Yeah. there's a lot of people who are still holding on in positions of power and leadership who are not haven't taken to the, like the market I feel like is like Nike. It's like tennis shoes are cool. We're going <laughs> to put some shoes, yeah. but then just do it comes and Oregon comes and I mean, and Phil Knight come, and then it's like, this is a big market. That's what yeah. I see. We're on the precipice of yeah. it's just a major need for what you're doing in organizations and teams. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been, um, there's so many angles on that. I don't know, you know, the whole thing about, I don't know if it was any worse. I know I'm, the world's just been weird and hard, like all figuring that out. And I, and I, I, you know, I think so often about people who leaders that we started this thing, another thing called the wild conversation that happens every Friday. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought, how do we serve people who may not be able to afford what we do, or how do we just serve our current client organizations that we're working with? So we launched this thing and it was Friday at 10 AM. And I thought no one's going to come. I just, I thought, you know, it's going to be on Zoom. We're going to make it awesome. We're going to borrow from Cirque du Soleil and the best thing that churches do and try to make this thing awesome and use music. And, and I'm just going to start presenting content for like 15 minute block on something I've been teaching for years and then let them talk. And, uh, and the first, I think the first week, 40 people came and I was like, we were like, Oh, something's going on here. So we have continued that since March of 2020. Mm. And, uh, and that's, that's been an, a really amazing experience. I just, I think one of the things that gave me insight into is like so many leaders who people who have significant influence are sitting alone in an apartment somewhere. You know what I mean? For long stretches of time. So I think the isolation piece for some people that I didn't experience, you know, I was, I was at a, I have my house and I, my wife and my kids were home at the time. So I, I didn't, I was doing fine compared to that. And so I think having right. that piece of it, um, but I think it just, what, what was cool was it, like I said, it exposed our roots. And um, we did some research on, this is a whole nother topic. I wrote a book called Composed, uh, The Heart and Science of Leading Under Pressure. So we did research for years on the things that allowed people to show up their best under pressure and show up well, and, like stay true to their convictions, but connected to their stakeholders at the same time. And the number one predictor, there were 11 strategies that emerged in that research that were important. The number one predictor of a person's capacity to show up well, whether well, it was a conversation with my teenager, or it was a, a much larger executive moment or a first level management moment, was, was sense of purpose. Mm. So it was the extent to which, and this, is, this emerged from our research in the early 2000s too. It was like sense of purpose was the most powerful variable. So it, it was knowing why you're in it. And so and it makes sense, right? When you think about think about psychologically what happens. If I'm going into a moment with my son and my son and I, my older son and I, we've had these moments. If I have thought about with intention and probably written it down why I'm his dad in this season of his life. Mm. When I get into that moment where that all those, you know, those dials buttons are being pushed. The reality was that if you know that it helps you to just stay composed in your best version of yourself in that moment. And, uh, and so like, as a team, we know that. And so we, we teach that to leaders all the time. I know you all do some of that work too. And, um, and so as a team, before we meet with any client organization, we ask ourselves almost to the point it's annoying. It was like, why are we here? So we think about that specific group of leaders and we answer that question as a team, because we know if everything else breaks down, the zoom breaks or the face of, you know, whatever, we will be our best selves in that moment. Mm. And, um, so that was, that's been a really important thing, I think for people in our sphere, because a lot of organizations, you were, you all have even told me about your work on alignment, you know, between an individual and their organization, but it's amazing how many organizations we worked with 
through these years who they're they're they may be making a lot of money and doing pretty well on the financial side Mm -hmm. who don't know why they're in business yeah and so you can't align so employees can't align to something that that isn't there and so a lot of our work has been like the leader goes like "Ah." so one of the questions we ask in the wild toolkit is what is your organization attempting to accomplish this year i can't tell you how many ceos are like i don't know make more money yeah (laughs) You know what I mean? Or like hire people because we have a labor shortage. And it's like, you you didn't do the work way back here. So anyway, this, this is some of the things I've been feeling. Yeah, this sense of purpose that you're talking about. And I love that idea of true convictions uh, that connected their stakeholders. I mean, mm-hmm. what, a, what a powerful idea. And I agree completely. This exposition, or is that even a word, Doc? Exposition? I like it. I like okay. it. The exposition of our roots. Let's okay. expose it all day long, John. Okay. 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 So, that, our roots have been words, so. that our roots have been exposed and, and uh, totally agree. And we've seen it time and time and time and time again. The pressure um, revealed who, where the cracks were, where the, and where the strengths were. You talked about it. And, and, yeah. and for us yeah. too, our kids, um, in our family, uh, I didn't, the isolation that you're talking about, we didn't experience. And we, we put our kids in Zoom for four weeks and then pulled them out and then went on the road. And, and so we had a lot of flexibility of time and proximity and the ability for our kids to thrive in a lot of ways. And so they're showing up with their friends with more courage and love and hope, you know, yeah. than, you know, and so we feel like a kind of an obligation, like put them in spaces where they can, they can do those things. Um, but the sense of purpose is a big passion of mine. You know, I, I just have this belief there's 7.9 billion or so. And in where, when you talk about sense of purpose of, of individually, and, and I, I'm sure you studied it, mm-hmm. before that, but like when I was five, a guy said to my mom, John's a leader. He says, he's either going to lead people to good things or lead them in jail. And the, the jury's still out, by the way. But you know, but you can do either. You could be a strong leader and do either, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And actually, he goes, "I've been doing this for forty years." It was a priest. It was a, but, but it made, I think about the power of that idea when we recognize often the gifts in others before they do, especially kids. Mm-hmm. You, know, you talk about 10, 12 year old kids where, where they're like, "Ah, oh, it comes natural to me." Yeah. Um, and, and it sounds like you at 25, you're like looking at the bar. You're, this is exactly what I'd say of you. Like you're looking at the bar going, shoot, it ain't that hard. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people would look at that bar and go, man, I, I couldn't even imagine being in the same room or same table. These people, they, they dress fancy and they talk real nice and, 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 and they're big words. And I don't know that I could ever, ever. You know what, and John, you know what the, the number two variable. So this is where I geek out a little bit. So literally what we look at is the amount of variance being predict uh, of composure being predicted by these variables. So Mm. the problem with these studies is when you plug these variables in, you start to soak up predictive capacity of the variables. Does that make sense? So Mm. the one that was overwhelming was sense of purpose. Now the 11 strategies all contributed and I could go on that list, but, but sense of purpose, if, if you looked at the general population, you look at overall population, that was the strongest. Yeah. Individuals, there were different ones of the 11 that, that came up, but the only variable that contributed over the top of sense of purpose. So additionally, yeah, was exactly what you're describing was focusing on potential. Mm. So it wasn't, it's not a, it's not optimism and it wasn't pessimism, but it was, yeah. it, I mean, it wasn't like I have a, 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 you know, half full glass of water, a half empty glass of water. It was a focus on positive potential outcomes. So Someone saying, I have a half full glass of water. What could I do with that? Mm. And so leaders who are able to, and I, I think, you know, from a deeper philosophical, theological orientation, that that is hope, that there's a big part of that, that what gets communicated. And so this was a person who was able to say, okay, I, the barriers are real, but my role as a leader, I've got to maintain this focus that says, what could we do? With what we've got with what we've got, which is very entrepreneurial also. So that was very, and it worked, those two variables together worked best. This is so fascinating for people who take things personally, Mm. which was most of our leadership sample. Huh? So that's fascinating. 
so people take things personally. So it's, you know what I mean? Cause leaders, yeah. personal. it's a very personal thing. So it doesn't surprise you, but anyway, th- so it's funny when you said that, I was like, yeah, there's that other variable. You're just describing it in your experience. How do you teach? And so, so you, you're born with a certain amount and you can learn a certain, you know, through various things, but that what you're talking about is gold. If you, I'm sure you guys do this in your work too, but the ability to help people to learn, to focus on what we have yeah. and to utilize what we have and to be resourceful with what we have. I, I can't remember who it was. He says very rarely do organizations fail for lack of resources, but lack of resourcefulness. Hmm. lack of resourcefulness so like what you're talking about is that capability to to use what we have and it's challenging for me personally i'm actually asking a question because i can use it in a conversation coming up maybe later today but like how do you teach how do you teach how do you communicate and teach that out to those who may have may have a, a, a you know that glass half empty um we're not going to be able to we don't have enough we don't have what we need. We need more. Uh, scarcity might be a word. Mentality. And it's fear-based. Uh, yeah. typically. So I discovered something over the years. Um, when we built the Wild Toolkit, and it's 10 different developmental assessments with feedback reports, but it includes some profiling, you know, research-based stuff, but it also has narrative in it. So it's like a person's story emerges as they answer qualitative questions and quantitative questions. But when I built it, I didn't want to put it behind a, a big wall. So I wanted to, I wanted to be like, people could go buy it and use it as individuals because of that. Um, and what's interesting about research is that I, I started doing some research into um, like how developmental readiness is increased. Mm-hmm. Just to what you're saying, developmental readiness is the concept kind of your part of what you're talking about is that right. openness to change. And um, because personality does play a role, by the way, psychologically speaking, so traits do play a role, but they're only 30 to 50% in a person. Mm. So the rest of it's up for grabs. Mm. So I designed this toolkit and I always felt responsible for the kinds of questions I asked, because like in my dissertation years ago, I asked questions that I'll never ask somebody again. Mm. Like um, how, how often in the last six months have you felt anxious, worried, or upset? And if you ask a person a battery of 60 questions like that, they leave feeling very anxious, worried, and upset. Mm-hmm. And so when we built this tool, because I wasn't going to just sell it to coaches, I wanted individuals to be able to pick it up in this kind of a grassroots moment. I had to build questions that had an appreciative nature that would leave a person in a better place than where I found them. This may be more than you want to know, but I had this discovery because I started looking into other scientists, this guy, a friend of mine over at University of Washington, did all the study on readiness. And he talks about how developmental readiness, that openness is increased through assessment. And so, but he doesn't say why. Mm-hmm. And so what I started, we started studying was the why. And one re- assessment basically is questions. So you ask a person appreciative questions that open up psychologically speaking efficacy. Mm-hmm. So the entire toolkit is, is a bunch of questions and they're not, they're not easy. Like the Adrian, the one I was asking you is like, um, uh, And so I, so anyway, what we found was that questions it's, I'm not saying that answers and like three steps to leading aren't sometimes important, but I think we, we do that part pretty well. Mm -hmm. It's the actually maintaining a posture of questioning with people Mm -hmm. that, that opens up their own efficacy and their own agency in the change. So what we found is that even with resistant people on teams, They've never seen a process like that. That's the unfortunate thing. They're used to leadership development that tells them, here's the five steps to leading well, as opposed to be invited in to understand those five steps on our own. Hmm. If that make if that makes any sense at all. Oh, so so give, us, give us an example yeah. of a question that would open up an efficacy. Um, so John, what would change if you were investing in the development of leaders around you? Right. Uh, As so, opposed to yeah. this is this is the typical thing, because I had a I say that because I had a senior leader. I'm about to go up on a stage with him in front of a couple thousand people, all this whole organization. And he says, OK, Rob, I'm really excited about launching whole leader development here. I'm going to get up there before I introduce you. I'm going to say everyone in this room should be investing in the development of the leaders around them. And I said to him, I said, great, but can I make it better? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Will you get up on that stage and will you say, what would change if every person in this room, if you 
we're investing intentionally in the development of the people around you. Mm-hmm. Do you feel the difference? It's like mm-hmm. now everyone is, we're not robbing of them of their best answer. They're going to answer the question for themselves. And be like, well, what will it change? And the, the problem that people experience is a dissonance because they're used to being given answers. So they're like, no, you tell me. And I'm like, no, you tell me. Right. Yeah. Now that's a good example, but I, it's, that's it's a great that. example. Yeah, yeah. That's a great example. Cause yeah. I think the first, like that first question or that first statement of you should be investing, then the, it like all of a sudden add something else to your to-do list, which then like just adds a little bit more like pressure that like, well, what if I don't do it the way that you think I'm supposed to do it? So like, you better tell me how I'm supposed to do it. <laughs> and I, <laughs> closed, I, just closed not winning. I would shut down. You should have me to stuff. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> but you asked me a question i'm like well that's a hard question but it's a good question you know like well let me think about it. I, the first thing i think about is like who are my, who's on my short list like what would change for my if i was intentionally investing in my wife you know that could convict me every day <laughs> so so i just it's a if there's one thing that even in my ted if there was one theme I was trying to invite people to, and I have a lot of mentoring, you know, I have a lot of advice to give, I have to really be careful about because I, but I think half of it is we just don't, we don't, we don't ask well. Um, and so that's kind of become a lot of the formation of what we do is this invitation to questions. Cause I think that our aspirations for wholeness, like what we, we're never going to fully achieve that, you know, like it's, um, but so much of that occurs through wrestling with the hard questions that we kind of wish someone would just give us our number and we could go home with that. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so are there, are there strategy? I mean, are there spaces? I mean, obviously when you've got a group and you're launching something, that, you know, from a keynote, but one-to-one, yeah. one-to-one is there a particular, you know, like the golf course. I love to play golf. I feel like it's a pretty good venue uh, I'm glad somebody does. Yeah, yeah, but but maybe maybe it's maybe it's the slopes, right? Uh, yeah, I love. Yeah, you know, I love, you're sitting on the chairlift and you're with somebody on your team and, and you're skiing, or or you're in an environment. Um, what's the best environment? I guess is there or is there any environmental concern to when and where and how the questions are asked? Because I I sense sometimes, um, yeah, that there's there's environments that are better than others. And and a lot of times it's like walking meetings can be good. You know, uh, a lot of leaders will, will, will go, go on a walk and, and, and chat it out and couples will. And when we can remember when we were doing that mile a day or whatever deal, like it was like those walks were valuable in terms of exchange of ideas. Well, I think one of the things I, yes to all of it. I mean, I think all of the whole person stuff about, you know, even just breathing, um, but what I would say is that we have been, and it actually spent a lot of resources on that architecture I described to you, because what we found is that even the concept of vulnerability, you, you have to be intentional about architecting that. And so, um, and people don't believe me until I actually get them, you know, finally they trust that this is true. Like, for example, with the tools that we provide, no one can see the results except for the user. Mm. and uh you can, i can't tell you like for years managers would ask me well of course i we're going to print off the feedback reports right i'm like no because we're not printing them off because then that user won't trust that you didn't look at them and would your responses change if your manager were looking at your results of course right so that's one example but what we even just thinking about what it means to crack open the door for just a little bit of increased vulnerability so that's why i think mm. start we, we start with like it, it is crazy when you architect it well how quickly people will open Right. Um, and, and within an hour and it's, it's, and zoom has actually created more intimacy faster, what we found than face to face. So when people say like, I'm, I get that people are tired of zoom. I understand that all day long, but I had a guy flying to town years ago. I'm not kidding. He flew into town to ask me this question. And he said, Rob, he was an older guy. And he's like, now I'm an older guy. And he said, can you <laughs> mentor people online? And I, I thought, I just, I thought of his question for a second. And I said, I said, well, as if we're doing it so well face to face, I don't care. Hmm. Like, just do it. Like, find a way. You know what I mean? Like, it's this. Yeah. It's like, yeah. can you can you develop yeah. leaders on Zoom? I would say you actually can do it better. Although people are just kind of they they associate Zoom with a lot of other stuff. 
but I'm just saying like with, with a well-architected open yeah. the door with maybe a simpler question. That's why we open everything with an icebreaker and then something that gives them a pathway. And then people will go there fast. And it's, yeah. um, but we always, we also do rules of engagement for every session. Here are the things to expect. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but I think that whatever well, it is, um, and I told you all that I, yeah. I end up going too fast too, too soon. <laughs> A lot of times. Well, and I, you know, it's like I always say, you know, people, what's the best version of the Bible? The one you read, you know? And so it's, it's <laughs> yeah. like, you know, they, we over, we overthink. That's good, right? Yeah. In a, just to just take action. Just, yeah. just, just do it, right? And take yeah. action. And no question that the returns, and I'm sure you're seeing this too, because, you know, obviously when they're spending tens of thousands of dollars, with your organization to use your tools, to have your training, have your coaching, uh, that they want to see the results. And I know we're seeing just, it's obvious, like the graph doesn't lie to your point on what would change everything. I mean, we would, you know, we would, we would be happier. We would make more money. Everything that matters to our organization, our people would be more higher contributors to the community. Like we would, they would be better spouses they'd be better parents like it all changes and and that so like every minute that people spend it's like i say training is not something you do it's some or something you did it's something you do like it's not something you did it's something you do right like like it's not these are perishable skills too like i like for me is it the ted lasso we're watching the last we're behind on ted lasso so we're watching the last episode last night of first season so i don't want right. to know what happens if okay you okay i won't share a thing yeah <laughs> but he talked about the gut or the uh, goldfish yeah. You know, yeah that memory and like i like to say we're not slow learners but we can be very quick forgetters yeah and so like the architecture i'm curious on the architecture organizationally um in families you know we we now have like a our family meeting has an acronym to it so our yeah. you know, Sunday night, our kids know like peace. The first P is for party. Okay. I can tell you that. And then yeah. it goes down the list to. Do you know when it. the, the uh, th- therapist, I, I'm fascinated by, I, I'm an integrator. So I think about different research bodies, you know, and so on in clinical psych in, in clinical psychology. It's interesting. Do you know when therapy begins? This, hmm. this blew my mind. So if somebody's gonna, so in clinical psychology, where somebody's gonna sit in, they're gonna be with a therapist, cozy couch. I mean, it probably is sooner than this, but when the person makes the appointment, right? Yeah. So that expression of intent, psychologically yeah. speaking, mm-hmm. is one of the most powerful variables. Did you all, did you also know that there are, there are placebo effects that a person who believes that they're gonna have positive therapeutic outcomes will have more positive therapeutic outcomes than someone who doesn't when they're sitting in the office. So it's, this is why contracting matters. Like it's the moment I am having a conversation with a CEO about working with their entire organization. I know that the, the contract has begun, mm-hmm. even if they don't, and if they don't bite and we say tough stuff, like we don't do any work, I, I'm getting down all kinds of bunny trails, but uh, one of the number one predictors, assuming I tell leaders this, if they're using the infrastructure of our tools, and they've got a they've got a cadence of conversations that are going to happen. I asked us uh, uh, two shared CEO. They own this business together. Yesterday, this question. I said, "Do you know what the number one predictor from the research will be of the effectiveness of this initiative?" I was like testing him. I got back into my prof- professorial face. You know. Yeah. The number one predictor is the um, the participation of those two CEOs. Right. And not not the buy-in. Not the buy-in. I don't want buy-in. I I them, what I told I them is that if you're not using this process, I won't work with you. Ah, oh, genius. Mm. That's good. Yeah. That's so good. The most powerful thing is I need them to come in and say, yep. let me show you what the skills and knowledge inventory showed me about my, 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 uh, my strengths and my blind spot. Yeah. And then everyone goes like, I've never heard the boss talk that way. You know, and it's just, it's no brainer, but to speak, yep. I just, I just know it won't work otherwise. So yeah, no, you're right. You know the I'm longest standing kind of email? You want to know the longest standing email in my queue right now? What's that? John Stanton, chairman and CEO of the Seattle Mariners. Yeah. So, so I was talking to them about a year ago. 
their organization, the executive assistant, talk to HR, talk to this, talk to that. I'm like, listen, I'm thinking to myself, actually, I kind of get it over email. We've missed the playoffs 21 years in a row in, in Seattle. And I've talked to people. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, we're the we're the losingest organization in Seattle Mayors, and they just have to own it. It's the losingest organization yeah. in all of professional sports as of right now. As of right now. And without John's so buy-in, it is <laughs> without John's buy-in, I ain't engaging. I'm not engaging. I'd probably get fired from somebody within the organization who doesn't want to do what it takes to win anyway, because we haven't been doing what it takes to win. So that's the, the, the challenge that you run into is that, and, and I don't, and you're with me, it's very, very difficult to lead up. So like, and I've been in a number of different roles and I am the same way. I need the head guy. Oh. But John, there's a key on what you said. You don't, don't ever use that buy-in language with him to, to get, him to right. do this you say i need you to participate in the process that's good because i i i can't tell you i got just over the years you get old enough and you've seen these things happen where i'm sitting in you know organization all of you know and everybody yeah. knows and yeah I'm sitting there and the ceo walks in i'm looking at millions of dollars in leadership development stuff on this giant wall yeah and i said i said so this represents millions of dollars in spending on this and i said do you use any of this so good. Is the CEO a leader? Uh, no, I don't use it. Well, what is it to you? This is not stuff we were providing. They wanted me to do succession planning system with him. And I said, so what is that to you? And he said, it's noise. Hmm. I am so done doing noise. And you know what I'm grateful I for? I just like. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give a shout out to my, my business partner, Pro Star. I've known him since second grade. I've known him since second grade. I know his wife listens to most of these. And, and, but, and I think he listens to some of them. But for 14 years, we've been in business. And every time I got another book study or another idea that's going to help us develop, he's the most participatory. And when I get off this call, even I'm going to call him and thank him because because I know that people watch that. They yeah, watch that. They do. They watch that. And and so we have, you know, our one of our insurance companies last couple of weeks ago, he says, you have the best people in the region. Hmm. Like it ain't even close. And he said, what is your secret? And I'm like, I don't, I mean, I, I can give you, it's like you, it's like, there's a lot of things that, you know, that we do and I can give you this and that and the other, the cultural things that we do. But at the end of the day, what you just said, I think is a big piece of it. And I haven't fully recognized it. And now Eric might still be on the golf course right now, but when he gets off, <laughs> okay. I'm going to, I'm going to call him and I'm going to give him a shout Cause I, I, I recognize what you're saying. Yeah. It's an aha for me. And, and that's why we do these. I mean, it, I mean that what you said. Yeah. Well, it's I, so good for us is it, cause we go in so often and we just want, you know, we're, we're new what we do. You know, this, you, you started the curriculum 12 years ago. We created it January, you know, one of our curriculums, January of 2021, it launched. Right. So, um, I'm so glad you're in this right. I'm telling you, I'm so yeah. glad. Yeah, this is, yeah. and to know you too is awesome. Yeah, and I feel really. good about it. But at the same time, like I'll be in a meeting, you know, at the critical point, and we will, we'll like, ah, oh, okay, let's do it. And yeah. then, and then what happens is it gets onto somebody else's desk, and then it it stalls in the process, or it's not as effective. Stalling in the process actually for me is better than. It's not as effective. It's not as effective. Yeah. But, you know, like, like I was with a football team and their head coach came in. They had won a single game the year before. They had a pretty good season last year and we're going to do it again. And um, But their head coach came to the first one. When we were with a car dealership, same thing. It was very effective. They've mm -hmm. grown like crazy. Yeah. And same thing, the the owner and GM, a 350-person organization, boom, he's there. You know, and and I've recognized that now. And you just saved me five years of headaches from taking yeah. taking on engagement. Well, and, and John, walk forward yeah. with this because it's not it's not just a good idea anecdotally. There's research around that, right? So it's been uh, I had a colleague uh, who did some awesome study on initiatives, and it, the number one thing was executive participation. So um, that's, that's awesome. why working with that's why working with small to mid cap businesses, by the way, has been an amazing journey. Hmm. It's well, a lot. Working in corporate context is 
uh, I did that for years and years and years. And our sweet spot has become the, the small, the mid cap, you know, the five to 500 million in revenue has just been because those places you can move the ship. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's fulfilling. Really, you all understand that. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. fulfilling. Well, I'll tell you this doc, Dr. Rob McKenna. I just want to say, I want to see how many times I can say doc on this. I gotta be honest. I was like, where's my dad? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. This has been awesome. And I, I really do. Uh, I know we're, we're about ready to wrap this and Adrian's got some final questions and you'll say some final things, but I want to let you know that if there's any way that we can help you further the work that you're doing, there's it's such a need for what you're doing in our communities, in our country and in the world, you know, I'm sure it can be translated over time if it hasn't been already. Um, that that please let us know and and uh, i'd love to talk with daniel and you uh just even on a uh, offline and just yeah i am very anecdotal and yeah. uh and a lot of times my anecdotes have backing that you 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 know they get yeah uh, yep solidified but but it could be a really fun conversation to have and likewise know that this is really good to know you and i um yeah but thank you it means a lot yeah well you're and you're further down the child you know the empty nest i'll, I'll tell nice you about that later when you get rid yeah, of your yeah. costco shelf <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. that's <laughs> awesome well this has been really this has been really really awesome we have very much appreciated to have you on the podcast with us we have one final question that we always ask our guests so if you have one thing that you would like our audience to know what would it be oh uh... I honestly, it would mean a lot to, this is not, this is not like that words of wisdom, but it would mean a lot if they watched the TEDx. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, because I did, it was my, it was the culmination of 25 years of my development into one moment. It's not the last moment, but it was pretty meaningful to me. And it it was a manifesto. It was on my heart. So, Mm -hmm. um, and if anybody does want to reach out, we just, we try to resource people no matter what, even if they aren't clients of ours and just go to contact at wildleaders.org. Um, for anything that folks need. I, I write white papers all the time on all kinds of topics. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and then if anyone wants to come to the Wild Conversation, uh, that's every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And if they can find that information on our website at wildleaders.org. So I just want to invite people in and, and to send them to you. And uh, I'm coming tomorrow. So I would love it. It's, it's tomorrow is yeah. going to be an interesting moment. So I'd love to have you there. But it's been it's an incredible community and people that feel like either, even if people are from parents to presidents, if people don't feel like they're leaders, you don't have to be that to come. Mm. It's just an incredible community of folks and it's, it's crowdsourced. So we just share some deeper thinking and let people like get smarter together. And I, I, it's been so transformational for me. So you literally go to resources, wild conversation, just register and get the zoom and come any Friday, any Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific time for one hour. It's awesome. Well, and I've experienced your events uh, when, when, you know, doing more, when you were doing more of those and I can attest to our listeners and, and we do, we, we want whole, the word that you use is whole. We want to shoot the moon. Like we, you know, when we talk about love the process. It's not just love the process of winning a business. It's not just love the process of winning it. And in, in your marriage or love the process, although that's yeah. important, or love the process of winning yeah. the father, you know, you guys, I know it when I see it and your community and your team and, and, and the mission that you guys continue to be on, it is, it's the real deal. So if do take him up on all those suggestions, um, please, because I, I really have watched you guys from afar um, and, and read a lot of your stuff and, and I'm encouraged by your guys' heart. Uh, to make leaders better, which makes the world better. So thank you. Can I give you a shout out too? Because that name on the back of your wall, love the process. The thing that I loved about this as soon as I saw it Mm. is that it is connected to reality and people don't love the process. Mm. I I don't even, I know how you all would use it, but, but they don't. And the, the system of things in your life, it takes that perspective and that is counter, that is counter to our culture. Mm. We're looking for arrivals, but this is a journey and we arrive and then we, we plan our next trip. We don't mm-hmm. arrive and stop. So that, I think that's what I, mm-hmm. I resonated immediately with even the name and the mm-hmm. brand that that's, that's different. Mm-hmm. And it takes people saying like, I'm, I'm going to lean into that. So I just love what y'all are doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. Well, thanks so much for being here. We are going to put your Ted talk in our show notes, check it out. Um, yeah, we are just very grateful for this conversation. Hope you have a wonderful week.
Thanks, Rob. Thank you all.